Good morning, Calvary. I greet you in Jesus' worthy name. God is so good. God is so amazing. Today, I'd like to honor God for his mercy. I was contemplating the last week about God's mercy a bit. God withholds from us many times the consequences that we deserve, and for that we honor him, his mercy. Is God good? Is God merciful? Say amen. 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 God is good. I want to give credit to uh, the message, to a message by Stuart Roots III on preaching.com, today.com for help with today's message. The title for today's message is God's Plan for Your Body. The subtitle is Bodies Are for Bonding. Our text is the same one we used last Sunday, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. Many of you have a tube or several tubes of super glue around your house. I won't ask for a show of hands, but many of us do. It's kind of a last uh, ditch attempt to fix something, many times not the best way perhaps, but we have some super glue around in your house. How many of you struggle with using that super glue? <laughs> yeah, again, it's, it's a real, it's, it's a really, really good stuff. They, they, they formulated it well, and if you use it right, it, it is really, really strong. But uh, when I go to get the super glue out of my desk, a lot of times it's one that I've used before, tube, right? And you go to unscrew the thing, and, and it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't unscrew. So you grab a pliers, and you, and then it starts squirting out the sides. And you grab your hands, and you try to, you know, and, and then your hands stick together, fingers stick together, right? And you're like, ah, and you pull it apart, and it's, it's, it's kind of a painful process sometimes. Super glue. Um, the word that we're going to be focusing in this morning on the message is joined. The ESV says joined. It is actually the root word is glue. If you look it back, it is the word for glue. Um, bond or bonding is, is, is a term that's often used. Bodies are for bonding, God's plan for your body. Our bodies are made for bonding. It's one of the reasons God gave us bodies, especially in our marriages, but also in our families, in our churches, in our youth groups, and with God. And like superglue, these bonds can be so good, or they can be so bad, and they are often permanent. And when you try to break those bonds, they make a big mess when you try to break them apart, and they never look the same again. And we have to be careful with the bonding that we do with our bodies so that we don't have them next to things that they shouldn't be bonding with. We need to bond in the way that God has intended for us to bond. I would like to think of the concept of bondable bodies as we read this passage from 1 Corinthians 6. And the word you're looking for is the word joined. And watch for it in verses 16 and 17. I encourage you to stand as we read 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to to 20. All things are lawful for me, the apostle writes, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined, and that's the word glue there, 
to a prostitute becomes one body with her, for as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined, there's the word again, glued to the Lord, becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You may be seated. Bodies are for bonding. This may be a new concept to you, but one of the reasons God gave us bodies is so that we can bond. We need to have the physical bodies. And I get this concept from verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. The word joined there is, um, according to Vine's exp expository dictionary, is the Greek word kolao, which means to glue or cement together. And it literally is taken from that base word, to glue or cement together, to unite, to join firmly. I went looking for a definition for bonding. And I was surprised how good a job Wikipedia did with this. But I'm going to read you the definition right from Wikipedia. Human bonding is the process of development of a close interpersonal relationship between two or more people. It most commonly takes place between family members or friends, but can also develop among groups such as sporting teams and whenever people spend time together. Bonding is a mutual interactive process and is different from simple liking. It is the process of nurturing social connection. Bonding typically refers to the process of attachment that develops between romantic or platonic partners, close friends, or parents and children. This bond is characterized by emotions such as affection and trust. Any two people who spend time together may form a bond. So that's a term for bonding, and most of you have heard this term, uh, bonding, in, 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 your, uh, in your experience or in your reading. It's the development of a close interpersonal relationship with other humans, and I want to say this morning with God. Bonding happens with God as well. It happens in families, it, and you often think of a child bonding with their parents their father or their mother. It happens in social groups who share interests and spend lots of time together. It happens in churches. Bonding happens in churches. And, and our bodies is what is used. It's the glue, if you will. It's, it's like the glue that, that this bonding is, happens through. Um, church bonding is especially important. I believe that we as a church here, as Calvary Mennonite Fellowship, has really experienced some bonding in the recent past. Um, when we come together and we do stuff together, just like what happened yesterday, um, when, we, when we spent this last year, whatever, working through a constitution and a covenant and all this kind of thing, there's a certain bonding that has happened. It's really, really important. It's, it's as we spend time together and do things together. Bonding is especially strong in sexual relationships. Sexual relationships create a superglue bond. Our text contrasts the bonding between a man and a prostitute with the bonding that happens when, with man and God. A Christian bonded to God should never bond with a prostitute. That is the basic message that this passage gives us. So the first type of bond we want to talk about is bonding with God. Um, verse 13 of our text, the section B, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, For God, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Our bodies were created by God to bond with God. They were a way that we could have a relationship with God. They're a gift from God. We are made so that we can bond with our creator. That bonding happened, as we read the story of Genesis, in, in early, uh, early after the creation of man. There was a bonding time that God had with man. If we read the account in Genesis 3, it talks about God going out into the, into the garden in the cool of the evening, and there would be a, a time that was spent with the first couple. And they would bond. They would bond together. It's a beautiful uh, uh, picture that we get of God bonding with his creation. We know that that, that bonding was, was damaged. When sin entered the world, that bonding got damaged. That relationship was damaged, and that bond was broken. However, that bond that we have with God is restored as a Christian. That bond that we had developed with God is restored, that relationship. We bond more strongly with God as we spend time with him, just like all bonds do. We spend time with God, and we bond more closely with God. As we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to cleanse and sanctify us, as we use the bodies that we have been given according to how he designed them for them to be used. As I was preparing this message, I thought of an example from the Old Testament of a man who bonded with God in a really special way. It happened before the flood. There was this, this man, Enoch. And I'll read a couple of verses from Genesis 5. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I preached a message one time on Enoch walking with God, and that, that is the bonding that I'm talking about this morning. He walked with God. Enoch walked with with God. There was a bonding time that Enoch had with God, and it seemed like it probably happened all the time. He continued to walk with God, a daily walk, a daily bonding, spending enjoyable time together, sharing deeply, laughing together, crying together, developing a deep and abiding relationship. Maybe if we bonded as well as Enoch did with God, we would also not need to die. Interesting thought. Wouldn't that be neat? So bonding with God. Secondly, bonding with the body of Christ. Do you not know, he says in verse 15 of our text, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. It's incongruous. It's, it's totally unthinkable that you would take a member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute. Reading from 1 Corinthians 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So what he's saying here is that we, in this local setting as Calvary Mennonite Fellowship, are members of the body of Christ. You are, you are, you are, I am. We are members of the body of Christ as Christians. Not just our spirits, but our bodies as well become a part of Christ's body, the church. We're part of the worldwide body of Christ, and we're part of a local body here in Mount Clinton. As a family of believers, we bond together. We should. Each one of us, we, as we bond together as a visible, tangible body of Christ. Christ is the head of the body. We are members. And uh, we may represent, we don't know what part of that body. 
Some of you are, one of you is a big toe, one of you is a liver, one of you are whatever. We're part of the body of Christ, okay? We sing together, we spend time together, we pray together. We laugh together, we cry together, we work and play together, we eat together, we develop relationships together. At Calvary Mennonite Fellowship, we bond together using the physical bodies that God has given us. It's important that we do that. It's a part of healthy church life. So many churches in our American culture get together for Sunday morning for uh, an hour or whatever and get their spiritual fix for the week, and they're off into their own, and they're not really bonded as a body of Christ. They are alone, and this is the curse of our modern American culture is when we are alone. We are alone. We are not part of the body in, in a practical sense. We're not bonded together. We're off by ourselves. We're in our virtual world, and we're not bonding well as the body of Christ. God didn't mean for us to be that way. I don't know what your experience was with COVID here in the last couple of years. It wasn't a real good bonding time, was it? It's hard to bond virtually. Okay, you're there watching someone preach a message on your computer screen or whatever, and, and the bonding is, is, is not, not, not that effective. And I, like I say, I think this, this, this bonding that, that we've experienced as Calvary Manor Fellowship has been really, really healthy in the last recent together. So that's bonding in the body of Christ. Bonding in marriage is the next thing I want to talk about. Do you not know, he says, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now, you don't have to cover your children's ears. I'm going to be discreet this morning. Okay, if, if you want to, you can. Sexual intimacy is one of the strongest God-designed bonding agents that is available to human beings. It is the superglue that bonds. It's the superglue of all bonds. It soaks into the very pores of our beings and grips tightly to hold together. This bonding agent is only designed to be used in a relationship that is irreversibly linked and committed till death do us part. Amen. Absolutely. That's where this bonding agent is to be used. This bond of, of sex is to be used in a committed, only in a committed marriage relationship till death do us part. It never should be used anywhere else. It's like using the super glue. We want to make sure the pieces are in good alignment before we stick them together, right? We want to make sure they're there where they should be and we're committed to that, that bond, if you will. This bond is so strong that the scripture says, and Paul here is is quoting from the Genesis account where it says that the two will become one flesh. You can never totally pull the pieces apart without tremendous damage. And that damage remains even in a legitimate marriage later on. The damage remains. You say, well, God forgives. He does. God absolutely does forgive. But there's damage. There's damage that remains. Engaging in sexual intimacy outside of marriage just makes a mess out of God's plan for your body. We can see the external consequences, such as pregnancy, shotgun weddings, damaged relationships, ruined ideals, the guilt, the regret. What is not so visible is the bond that is now forever messed up. And I'm speaking especially to you young people that are here today. I want you to really listen up as I talk about this kind of bonding. Because you're at the position, most of you, that you can, you can, you can really 
really, really prevent this from happening. Understanding that this bond that happens is reserved for marriage. It is not to be done in any other, any other setting. Because we just mess up God's plan when we do that. The casual view of sex in our culture today is so terrible. They don't realize. They say, well, it's just a physical thing. Yeah, it's a physical thing, but there is a mysterious bond that happens. There is something that happens, and I, I can't explain it to you, but there is a bond that happens. And that bond is, is meant to be permanent. It's not meant to bond here and bond there and bond there. It's meant to happen in marriage, in a committed, committed relationship. I want to talk about now unholy bonding. I've already begun to talk about it. Verse 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Sex is a God-given drive. We know that. God gave us these drives, and they are not something shameful. They form a part of the relationship in our families. They are part of the closeness in marriage, a super bond that God intended. They are beautiful in the way that God intends them to be. Behind our physical hunger for food, the sex drive is a strong second in our experience, especially in our younger years. Young people, listen up. Like every beautiful creation of God, these drives must be kept in the context that God intends. Their blessing becomes their curse when misused. Satan knows that. He exploits our natural needs and desires for his own malicious intent. What is natural and good in its proper setting becomes sin outside of that place. It's one of the sins that is destructive to so many people. What makes sexual sin different? Aren't we not forgiven when we sin sexually? What does it mean to sin against your own body? Let's see what we can find out. I'd like to give credit to this list to, to Jack Hayford. He's a, a minister that you probably have heard maybe on the radio or so. Sex sins, he says, are not harder for God to forgive, but they are more damaging and, at a, personal and, so, and at, at a personal and social dimension for the following reasons. Number one, emotional damage. Emotional damage that happens. Emotional damage happens when we engage in sex sin. It exploits the deepest aspects of our emotionality. It awakens our deepest passions. It also exposes us to the greatest possibility for emotional violation and injury. In a sexual relationship, we give ourselves away. That's God's design. In a casual relationship, a piece of ourselves is gone forever. It's that damage from breaking the glue joint apart. Tenderness is replaced with hardness and world weariness. I know you've seen that in our culture. God designed for our emotions to be tied up with our sexual relationship. In a committed godly marriage, this is a huge stabilizer for us. When it's engaged in outside of marriage, it wrecks havoc to our emotional stability. God forgives, but the emotional damage is there. There's a hardness there, and there's a loss of a part of ourselves that's never totally replaced. The second um, thing that makes sexual sin different is uh, guilt. Guilt is different from other sins. There is a tremendous guilt that's there, and, and guilt, as we know, is God-given. No other sin produces the dimension of guilt and condemnation in believers like that of sex sin, despite their understanding of forgiveness. I read the testimony of a Christian young man who had a one-night stand with a divorced woman. This young man repented sincerely and cut off all ties, but the guilt 
just stayed on and on and on. There's a measure of guilt that makes this sin unique. Thirdly is unnatural appetites. What makes it different is unnatural appetites. Sex sin gives place to appetites that only beget further unnatural behavior. The law of the flesh is that covetousness takes over and we never get enough. There is never enough. We're never satisfied. The appetites have been perverted. Number four, damaged relationships with your marriage partner. Open communication, of course, trust is lost many times. Trust is lost. I guess our clock is not working, so I, you are just going to have to forgive me. Okay. Sex sins compromise the foundation of life's deepest human relationship. Number five, damaged relationship with Christ. In the text that we are using this morning, for the believer, sex sins are worse than others because in sexual immorality, a believer prostitutes the body of Christ. The bonds in the family of God are now all messed up with bonds with that prostitute. I'd like you to contemplate that just a little bit. And that's why it's so important as a body of Christ that we don't tolerate immorality in the body of Christ. If there's open sin that's not taken care of, it needs to be put out of the body of Christ because now we have, now we have this, this member who is part of the body of Christ becoming also a member with a prostitute or some other sexual perversion that's going on. And that cannot be. The apostle says never, never, never let that be. Okay, we want to move on then to some moral guardrails. That's the bad news that I'm preaching to you this morning. We can do some, put some place, something in place. And young people, I'm talking to you especially. There are moral guardrails that we can put in place that can avoid this kind of thing happening. You all know what a guardrail is, right? Beside the road, you're, tearing, you're driving along and, and you, there are guardrails. The guardrails are there for two reasons. Two reasons that you have guardrails beside the road. One of them is a visual aid to, to let you know how far away you are from, from danger, right? The other one is a, a bit of protection, if you will, that you can actually bump against the guardrail, at least mildly, and you might not go over the, uh, over the edge. So guardrails are things that we can use in our experience to keep us out of trouble, keep us on, on the right path. And they're listed in scripture. The first one here is flee. You get into a compromising situation, don't stay there. Get out. And we often think of the example of Joseph in the Old Testament. He got out. And uh, he was a wise young man beyond his years. Get out, get away from it. Don't dilly-dally around. Our passage of scripture this morning in, in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee, flee away. Go away. Don't, don't, don't hang around. Number two, clean thoughts is another guardrail. Clean thinking is what our guardrails. If your thoughts are clean and pure, it's a sign that you're on the road. You're not up against the guardrail. If you're struggling with impure thoughts, it's a good indication that your moral guardrails are not as close in as they should be. You want to establish a guard on your eyes, not staring at indecently dressed women, looking away quickly. Pornography, don't ever go there. Get out of there. A guard on your ears. Proverbs 4 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. 
Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Pure thoughts, clean thoughts are a good indication that you are on the right track. Number three, standards. For you young person who are dating or anticipating dating, you need to set standards for your, your courtship, your dating relationship, and you need to set those early on and don't go beyond them. You're not, you're not as strong as you think you are. Number four, opportunity. Many crimes that are committed today are crimes of opportunity, and so are sins. Don't set yourself up. Don't set yourself up. One of the things I want to really mention to you married people, something that's brought home to me is that don't engage in long, deep conversation with someone who is not your wife. even if it's the pastor. That is setting yourself up. Crimes of opportunity. Number five, emotional connections. Don't share with someone who is not your partner with deep emotional conversation. And number six is accountability. Let someone know that you're struggling. And I think that's something that, uh, that Josh is going to be talking about tonight at our men's meeting, um, is accountability and what we can do with accountability for our relationship as men. Um, We didn't co coordinate this thing at all, <laughs> Josh and I. It's just amazing how God works these things out. And uh, so anyway, call to action in this morning's message is glorifying God with our bodies. And that's found in the last couple of verses of our text. It's a call to action. It's the application in this message. He says in verses 19 and 20 of our text, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I want to read a couple of verses from 2 Timothy, having to do with um, being vessels of honor for God. 2 Timothy 2 says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The word picture here is that in a great house, there are many vessels. There's fine china up in the cabinet, contrasted with a wastebasket over here by the, the counter on the sink. Many, many vessels, all vessels. He says, purify yourself, and you will become a fine vessel for God to use. And the choice is ours, brothers and sisters. The choice is ours. Cleansing ourselves from what is dishonorable. Cleansing ourselves from the shady stuff that we might be getting into. The things that, that we might be getting that are, that are fringe. Okay, you know it's fringe. You know you shouldn't be there. Cleanse yourself from that stuff. Choose the middle of the road. Go that way and you will be a vessel of honor for God. Number two, dis, dis, disciplining our bodies for God. And we talked about that last Sunday quite a bit. Disciplining our bodies for God. Endure hardness. Push away from the table when we've had enough. Flee from sexually charged situations. Turn off that computer or that TV or that phone. 
Discipline is needed to glorify God in our bodies. Number three, conducting ourselves in a God-honoring manner, bringing glory to God, making God look good with the way that we maintain our bodies, identifying with God in the way we look, in the way we act, in the way we talk, making God proud. Finally, number four, putting our bodies on the altar. Your body, physically, Romans 12, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, not your spirits. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Giving up control, making sacrifices as he asks us to. Putting our bodies at his disposal. I want to wrap up with just a little bit of a recap God has a plan for your bodies. He does. Each one of us, God has a plan. Part of that plan is bonding, bonding with God, bonding with the body of Christ, bonding in marriage, and shunning unholy bonds. Shunning unholy bonds, those things that would drag us down, those things that would mess up our lives shunning those bonds and bonding as God intends. God bless you. We'll call for a song.